Behind me is the grave of Juan Elizigi, and I apologize if I pronounce some of these names incorrectly. I don't know how to speak Basque or really pronounce it very much. I've never met a Basque person. But Elizigi was killed in 1985 by members of GAL, which was accused by some outsiders of amounting to basically a death squad. GAL was active in the regions of France and Spain, and they were promoting, under the name of anti-terrorist liberation groups, the murder of these Basque separatists and often members of ETA, which Elizigi was, or Elizigi was. You can see on the grave behind me he was murdered in 1985 because he had left his home in, apparently from what I've read online, the coastal region of Basque country in Spain, which had a sizable number of refugees, people fleeing from this sort of conflict, because for a period of time, this region of Spain really was similar to a soft-scale troubles in Northern Ireland. This was happening in Spain as well. And the anti-terrorist liberation groups active throughout Spain and France were targeting members which they viewed as terrorists, uh, people that were revolutionary, Marxist-Leninist, communists, and they targeted him. And I believe he left a family behind as well. Uh, but one of the interesting things that you'll notice about his grave is that it displays the, the symbol of the ETA on it. Not the swastika, but if you look closer, it actually has the ETA logo on it, which is a designated terrorist organization in Spain. However, this symbol has remained up in this churchyard. There's actually another person in this churchyard as well who was a member of the ETA and later had to step down and I believe was also assassinated by either police or the GAL. Apart from the other ETA grave, which I can actually see just about 20 feet ahead of me, right now behind me are the graves of two other ETA members, some of them very important. In fact, the one that's larger, Tixikia, actually has folk songs written about him in Basque Country. And what's important to know is that Tixikia, from a very young age, from the age of 10, was put into a Benedictine monastery. He served about 12 years there before he left and joined the ETA in 1966, at which time he was actually given the code name Tixikia. And during this time, the ETA was not a communist, Marxist-Leninist revolutionary group. This change only came about after he'd already served in the ETA for a good period of time. So what's important to know is that the ETA itself, in the early days when he joined it, was led by a man named Jose. And this group was not Marxist-Leninist. It was simply to fight against Francisco Franco and to fight against this fascist dictatorship that had taken root in Spain. And in 1970, September 1970, a conference of the ETA led to them rebranding their organization as insurrectionary Marxist-Leninists. And a lot of the old members, because Tixiquio was the right-hand man of the original ETA group, a lot of the old members decided that they didn't want to be a part of this. So the ones who didn't leave to France or other countries rebranded themselves as ETA-5, whereas the Marxist-Leninist one rebranded as ETA-6. And because a lot of the popular support in local communities was given by, you know, young, enthusiastic, and very impressionable students and college kids and, and the youth and the workers, a lot of this support was given to the communist ETA-6. In fact, in 1971, uh, Tixikia's advisor, the leader of ETA-5, the military wing, because you have to remember ETA-5 was essentially all of the actual rebels, and ETA-6, the communist one, was just the intellectuals. The military wing split off to become ETA-5, and in 1971, the leader of this military wing, which Tixikia was sort of a advisor to, finally decided to step down and go into hiding. In 1973, he was tracked down by this GAL, which killed the man in front of me, and he was shot in the head. Uh, these people behind me, it's interesting to note that although they were a part of the ETA, you could argue that they weren't a part of the larger communist version of the ETA. They were similar to the provisional Irish Republican Army in a sense that they were using terrorist tactics for what they thought was good. I'm not going to make any comment on if I think that uh, the goals of these groups were 
good or justified or the actions they used were justified, but they often attacked military targets and police and not soft targets like civilians. As ETA rebranded itself into becoming more of a communist group, they started attacking more civilians and it started changing the public perception of the ETA. So the original ETA, under men like Tixiquia, was actually a group to fight Spanish uh, fascists. Francisco Franco, because Americans don't know, a lot of Americans don't know that after World War II we thought that fascism had been defeated in Europe, when in reality Spain had held a grip on this fascist government under Francisco Franco, which continued up until the 1970s. And this government just continued operating openly. And people who had different ideas, Catalonians, Basque people, anybody in Spain with an idea that was opposing to Francisco Franco's dictatorship were generally put down. And so groups like the ETA and groups like Catalonian separatists became much more popular. And nowadays America knows only more about Catalonia because of reasons I've already listed. meters at the roundabout continue straight to stay on the like alia no matter where you are in the world from Germany with the Red Army Faction, or Northern Ireland with the Provisional Irish Republican Army, or even in Wales with the Free Wales Army, you have your own martyrs. You have uh, Dennis Coslett, you have K.O. Evans, you have any number of IRA prisoners, there's a whole cemetery devoted to them. You have uh, Bader Meinhof. Behind me are two of the last men to be executed in Spain for their role in the ETA. In 1973, they killed a police officer and they became sort of local folk heroes because they were fighting with the ETA. Now, if you take a look at the land around me, you'll notice we are not too far from the ocean. You can actually see the ocean from where I'm standing uh, at the beginning of the cemetery. And the importance of this is that throughout its history, the ETA has had varied support from different geographic regions of the Basque Country. The entire Basque Country has not always agreed with the ETA's actions. In fact, a lot of the Basque Country has been behind Spain, but especially in the grave we saw in the last graveyard, which had the ETA logo on it, he, before moving to uh, the Basque regions of France, he was living probably along the coast around here. There were a huge number of refugees and political dissidents that were living along the coastal communities, especially because it was very easy to hop from where I am right now into France. And through the years, France has had a very lenient policy with political dissidents, especially back in the Cold War. Their mentality was, if you don't mess with France, you can take refuge in France. And these two men behind me were living in this local community when they killed this police officer in the 1970s. And this was the last execution performed in Spain in its entirety. And their graves behind me are sort of shrines to the cause and shrines to the ETA movement.
Well, I am still in Basque country, but I guess the question now is whatever happened to the Basque ETA? Uh, they're no longer active. As I mentioned before, back in 1970 in September, they split between ETA 5, which was non-communist, it was the military wing, and ETA 6, which was Marxist-Leninists. Uh, composed mostly of the intellectuals. Over time, ETA 6 became the real ETA, and ETA 5 more or less ceased to exist. And in 2006, the ETA essentially tried to hold a peace conference. They went to Norway with a series of representatives, and what had happened was they said they had, I believe, anywhere between 20 to 50 active members on reserve, meaning they still had their weapons stockpiles from the Cold War. Somewhere in the Basque country and the leaders of the ETA essentially told them lay low we're going to these peace negotiations and the peace negotiations fell through because these ETA leaders were demanding a release of what they called political prisoners now the ETA and a lot of Basque nationalists will call these ETA prisoners political prisoners when in reality they are people who killed police people who lit off car bombs, people who were involved in a series of murders to promote their independence movement. And because of this, the negotiations fell through, and these ETA leaders that went to Norway to try to make the negotiations went into hiding. Now, they were laying low for a number of years, and in 2011 they appeared in their typical ETA uniform, a white pillowcase with the eyes cut out and a French beret, a black beret surrounding a table with a number of weapons on it and they read out a ceasefire statement basically declaring the ETA null and void and disbanding all of the armed members. This was in 2011 and I believe a few years later in I think 2015, 2016, three plus of those members were arrested just north of Spain in France. Literally a, a one minute drive across the border in these communities. And I believe now all five of the members who were reading out the statement disbanding the ETA have been apprehended. So the ETA as we know it from the Cold War has ceased to exist. And that's one of the fascinating things about all of these political movements. Uh, you've got the Red Army Faction, the Palestine Liberation Organization, the ETA, the Provisional IRA, and they are coming and going but new ones are taking their place. Now we have Transnistria, now we have Donetsk, we have Nova Russia, we have uh, different Catalonian groups now that are coming to power, and pretty soon I believe we're going to have some, just my prediction, in Scotland, because of the referendum they're planning there. Now, it's interesting to think of all of the Europe that could have been. Basque country could have been independent. Spain could be divided into five or six countries right now, but it just never was because they had a strong government. Now that the Spanish government is weakening, I can totally see Catalonia or Basque country declaring independence at some period in the next few decades. And it'd be interesting to see in my lifetime just what happens here in Basque country.